let's go to my last slide. What is Play Framework? So Play Framework is a web framework for writing Java or Scala applications. So you can either use Java or you can use Scala. Uh, both APIs are first class citizens in the Play stack. Uh, it supports fast development groups. So when you make a change, like Ruby on Rails, like, uh, like PHP, you see it um, in, the, in the browser. You just hit refresh and you can see your change. Uh, it's completely asynchronous I.O. Okay, so uh, there's, there's no blocking uh, unless you decide to do blocking. And so, so when you're doing, when you're talking to, to the front end, when you're streaming data, everything's completely asynchronous. It has first class support for the modern web. And what I mean by this is uh, all those front end technologies, uh, things like uh, CoffeeScript, uh, less and and things like that are supported first class, which is my next point. It also supports things like web sockets and server sent events as first class citizens. You don't need to do anything special. You don't need to uh, switch back to vendor specific APIs or anything like that. Uh, and also, JSON is of course a, a, a first class citizen in a lot of frameworks. It's kind of this thing that's been added on, but JSON is very much first class in, in play. So like I said, this is my last slide. For the rest of this presentation, uh, we're going to do some coding. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start MongoDB. And I'm just going to remove that. And now I'm using uh, a tool called Activated by TypeSafe which um, is a way to get ver started very quickly with Scala applications, including play applications. So here I can uh, select a template. That's not what I wanted to do. And I'm going to use a template that uses uh, MongoDB and Knockout.js. So now I'm going to start it, and this might take a few seconds. So this uh, template that I'm using, um, it's, it's a template. Uh, Activator actually lets you contribute your own templates, and there are, there are a big range of uh, templates to choose from. Uh, this particular one, um, uh, actually showcases a lot of, uh, it uses CoffeeScript, it uses less, uses Require.js and Knockout.js, all that, that stuff on the client side. And on the server side, it's using MongoDB with uh, Reactive Mongo, which is an asynchronous Mongo database driver. So I've just generated the idea, IntelliJ idea binding, so now I can open it in IntelliJ. And I've also run it and so if I hit refresh there, we should get our application running. So it's just got to compile to the initial compile. And here we go, here's my template application. So I might make that a little bit bigger. Okay, so what we have is a simple mes messages application. You can click here and add a message. And I didn't clear my MongoDB database before I started. start MongoDB before I started.
So let's see if that works now. And perhaps I might just have to restart. And there we go, it did work. Okay, so sorry for that. Uh, so one of the things about this uh, template application is I can open it up in another browser. And I can add a message. And we can see it appears immediately in both browsers. Uh, because this is a, a reactive application and it will respond to user events rather than just happening, uh, requiring refreshes and things like that. So what we're going to do today is we're going to start adding some features to this application. And we're, so we're going to get a tour of Play and how Play works and how this application works um, from, from doing this. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add an author field to messages. So I've opened the application in my IDE and we can see it looks fairly like a Ruby on Rails application at first. And the first thing we're going to look at is the index template. <laughs> so uh, this, is, this is the thing that's rendered by the index page. Uh, you can see it's, it's using um, a lot of uh, bootstrap classes. Uh, this is the modal. Uh, down here we've got that spiel that's on the left. And here we've got the list of, uh, of um, messages themselves. You can see data bind tags here. These are used. This is how Knockout uh, binds uh, areas of your website to, um, to data coming from the back end. And we'll start by adding an author field into this. So I've added a new field. You can see... It's called the label is author, and there's a, um, a it's bound to a backend a knockout um, property called message author field. So why don't we go and add that into the uh, knockout code? So I'm using um, uh, Coffee Script here. Uh, this is Require JS here. One interesting thing that you can see here is that uh, all my uh, JavaScript modules are prepended with this WebJars thing. Now, what is WebJars? WebJars is a way of letting your build system manage your dependencies for you. So the build system, you never have to download them. You just say, here, I want this dependency, this version. It goes, downloads the dependencies, not just the dependencies, but the dependencies, so transitive dependencies. So you don't need to manage them. You can upgrade them with a simple version number increase. And uh, you can see here, in the project's build file, I've declared these dependencies on uh, on uh, Bootstrap, Knockout, Require JS. I didn't put uh, put jQuery in there, but it comes in transitively from both Knockout and Bootstrap. So here we have our um, message field, and we're going to add our message author field as another observable. And if we hit refresh now and then hit add message, we should see our author field. So, and I can type a message and nothing won't happen because I haven't uh, said how this is gonna get submitted to the server. So, uh, down here we have um, our, our save message method, which uh, converts our messages into some JSON. And I'll add the author field to that. And now we'll head to the back end. So this save messages calls makes an AJAX call here, uh, which makes calls this. This is actually called a JavaScript reverse route. It's a feature of Play where Play generates all this JavaScript code for, for you. So you don't have to worry about what your paths look like and about building strings. Uh, it does it for you. So we can go and find this messages controller, and we can see. Uh, this is what gets called when you uh, submit um, when you submit a message. So what it's going to do here is uh, if this is declaring an action and it's going to parse the body of that action as JSON and then 
we've got some code here that um, binds the, the body here into this message form. So to this message form, we'll add an author, uh, an author field. And that message form converts to the message object, which gets saved in our, in our back end. So we'll add, add the uh, author field to there as well. And then we'll pass the author to that message, to, to the message form. And then this is going to call on our DAO to save, uh, save the message. So uh, one thing that I'll do now is is update all the existing data in, in my MongoDB to add an author to every single message. And if I refresh, I'm not sure if I clicked. I think I clicked close there. There we go. And now hopefully my author should be saved, but we haven't done anything to render it yet. So why don't we add some code to render it back in our index. We've got our list of things here. Uh, it's a very simple list item, we'll delete that and replace it with this code here that renders both the author and the message. And now if we refresh, we can see we've got the author. It doesn't look very nice, so let's style it a bit. Uh, we're using less for styling, using Bootstrap for most of the stuff, but we need to use less a little bit, and we'll add some styling. So Play actually supports um, less out of the box. You just add your less files, and it's there, and now that looks sort of pretty. I'm not a, much of a designer, but that's the best I can do. So. We've now uh, got our author. Uh, another thing feature that we might like to see on a message board like this is the ability to like messages. So uh, why don't we add that? It's very social and everybody likes social stuff. Um, I'm going to start this time in the back end. So we'll go back to that um, message object. So this is what actually gets saved to MongoDB. You can see it's got an ID field, so the ID, uh, that's users underscore ID, which is the MongoDB way of saying this is the ID. Um, message and the author will add a likes integer. Also, you might notice here there's a message format. Okay, now what this is, is uh, something important to emphasize about Play is that it is uh, very type safe. Uh, things, uh, so for example, the templates, they get all compiled. And um, if I were to put some invalid Scala there and then hit refresh, it tells me I've got an unmatched bracket. Uh, and you know that at, um, at compile time. Um, anywhere if I, uh, for example, uh, changed. If I was to add a, um, I'll show that a bit later. Um, but what the me the message format does is it um, it compiles at, at comp compilation time a way of serializing these um, the message to JSON and from JSON, and and that means uh, we know at compile time if it's going to succeed at doing that. If you put a property on there, say a socket, a socket can't be serialized, it's going to throw an error at compile time saying, no, you're not going to be able to, 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 to serialize the sockets to JSON, so don't even bother. So you'll see a few of these formats around the place. Uh, for example, here in our form. Now, when, we, when our form comes in and we're saving a new um, message, we'll start off with zero likes. And while I'm here, I'll also initialize the likes of everything that exists to zero. Okay, so now we've got um, our likes in the back end. Let's, let's now try and render it. So uh, 
I'm using Bootstrap, a Bootstrap uh, glyph icon there, that's from Bootstrap 3. And if we hit refresh, we can see we've now got a likes field with a little thumbs up there. And, they, and again, we'll apply some styling to that. And that looks a little better. Okay, but obviously the likes don't do anything yet, so let's define an action um, in, the, in the back end to handle that. So we're going to go into the uh, code for talking to MongoDB now. Um, and this uh, uses, like as I said, reactive Mongo. Now, so one thing about reactive Mongo is nothing blocks. So when you make a call, get me something, save this, it returns immediately. You don't have access to whatever you just got. What it does return is a future. And a future is something, or in, in other languages they're called promises, a future is something that will hold a value in future, but you can't access it now. Now, how do you, but how, how do you access it? The way you access it is by mapping it or flat mapping it. Uh, flat map, if you've done Scala, that's also, uh, if you've done Haskell, it's, the bind is the same thing. Uh, it's basically the monad uh, method on future. And, um, and, and so using these, you can then compose futures together and eventually uh, return a result back to the framework. So we'll start, rather than going through all the existing code, we'll write a new method from scratch for creating like the, uh, for liking and something. So we've got our like function. I'm actually going to put this up a little higher so people can see it. Uh, it takes the ID of the thing that you're going to like. Uh, and it returns a future of boolean. So the boolean is going to be true if it found the message with that ID, or false if otherwise. So now we're going to um, call an update call on MongoDB. So MongoDB supports uh, atomic updates. The first thing that you need to pass to it is a query string for what to update. So the query is uh, the, the object with an ID that matches the ID that we just passed in. And then the update command. So in this case, we're doing an atomic increment on the likes field, incrementing it by one. Now at this point, MongoDB has returned us a future um, of something called a last error. A last error is a command in, in MongoDB that says the status. It's a bit misleading. It doesn't mean there was an error, just the status of the last command. What we wanted to do is return a future of Boolean. So we want to map that last error to a Boolean. So we're going to do that by using a map call and passing a callback that will be executed once this is available. And so if, if it was OK, then uh, we'll return true if the number of documents that were updated is equal to one. So if only one document, if, if no documents was, were updated, i.e. the ID wasn't found, then it's going to be, n is going to be zero and we'll return false. And if there was an actual error, we're just going to throw it. So now we've implemented it. Um, our logic and our message DAO, we're going to go to our controller and add a new method there. Okay, so this is going to be an action. Again, it takes an ID as a parameter. It's going to be an asynchronous action because it's going to be doing uh, some non-blocking calls and so it can't return a result immediately to the framework. And so play uses this async contract, construct so that you can return a future to it. It'll do our call, but this returns a future of a Boolean, and async action needs a future of a result of an HTTP result. So we're going to map that. And if it was true, then we return success or no content, because we don't have any content to return. 
and if it was false, then that means it wasn't found, and so we'll return not found. So how does uh, play know to call this, me this like message method when you've saved, um, when, when you've made your request? And the answer is by looking at a routes file. So routes are also uh, compiled at um, strongly typed. Uh, if I were to, um, for example, this has a default, this thing takes an integer. If I was to put a string in there as the default value, uh, then you'll notice that I actually get a compilation error because it's saying that needs to be an integer, but it's a string. So we've got strong, strongly typed stuff there. Um, so uh, we, at our route, we want, um, if you're going to like something, then you're posting a like, and the URL will be messages. You can see the colon ID, that's a um, <coughs> parameter, so it'll extract that out and pass it to us. And then we'll, we'll invoke like message on the message controller. And so now we have to find our route. Now there's one more thing that we need to do, and that is, I mentioned the JavaScript router before. This method here is defining what uh, JavaScript routes are exposed. And so we're just going to add the, that, um, that uh, method that we just created, or that route that we just created to the JavaScript router so that we can call it from the front end. So now we've got done the back end work, let's do the front end work. So we'll go to our coffee script, and we're going to create a new like message method. So it'll take the message that has been liked, we'll make an Ajax call, and then here's where we use that JavaScript router, and we pass in the ID of the message. Now you notice here that I don't actually have to worry about building that URL. In fact, I can change it at any time. And um, because I'm using the JavaScript reverse router, I don't need to worry about maintaining my JavaScript to match the URL. And finally, we want to hook up the click event on the like button to, our, um, to that method that we just created. So we'll do that using a knockout data bind. And let's see if it works. So I'll click some likes somewhere. And nothing's happening yet. Why not? Well, because we haven't uh, done anything to, to react to it yet. But if we hit refresh, we should see that those times that I clicked there worked. Okay, so this is a reactive application. You saw before when I added the message, it appeared in all the browsers at once. We also want the likes. So as soon as I click like, I want every browser to increment that number um, so that everybody can see that it's been liked immediately. So how are we going to implement that? Well, we should look at, at how the, uh, the messages is implemented first. So one of the things... Uh, a very naive way to do this would be to, to kind of store a, a list of listeners in memory in play, uh, and then whenever something happens, just tell them, hey, here's something happened, go and publish it, and it goes to the web interface, and everything's happy. And that'll work fine until you have multiple nodes of your application. Once you have more than one node, then you need some way to, uh, to communicate between those applications. And since I'm using MongoDB, and MongoDB provides something called capped collections, which let you tail them, I'm going to use that as my publishing mechanism. So what we've got here is a event DAO. And it's got a publish method that lets us publish a named event with some data. That serializes to JSON and calls this. And then it's going to save that event to, to the database. And then we've got a stream method. And the stream method is going to get, um, is uh, 
are going to do the query on the database to do the tailed collection. So it's going to um, only get the the um, the events that were updated since right now because when you you want a stream of current events, you don't want all the events that have already been put in the database. And this is the, the code to get a tailable cursor from MongoDB. Now this actually returns something called an enumerator. An enumerator um, is something that gets paired with an iter a t. An iter, iter a t is an asynchronous uh, way of consuming uh, data streams. So it's two way. When, when data is ready, it's pushed into the iter a t. The iter a t doesn't ask for it. And when the iter a t has handled that data, it goes and says, I'm ready for more data, but that's also asynchronous. So it doesn't request it, and the thing that it won't do anything until the iterate is ready. And so this way we can get back pressure working nicely uh, with asynchronous stuff. And so we're turning this into a broadcast enumerator here so that we can have multiple things connect to it. So in order to, to implement this, uh, we're going to go to our message DAO and then our like method. We'll publish it. And that's handled our, our, our back end. I should also show here's, we're actually using uh, server sent events here to convert this to an event stream. And now in our coffee script, um, I need to do a bit of housework here and convert uh, the likes into observables. So I've got a method here that in, in for each message will convert the likes to observables and I invoke that for each uh, data item. And also when we're listening and receiving events, we want to do the same thing. And now we're going to subscribe to those like events. So we add an event listener to the stream for like events. We get the ID, ID of the message. We then find that message. And if once we find the message, we increment likes. And so now, if I hit refresh on here, and hit refresh here, I should be able to like these. And you can see in both browsers, they update immediately. So, thank you for listening to my presentation. I like that a lot. And, yeah. Any questions? Yes, questions for James on the play framework, maybe his work in general at TypeSafe. Yep. Um, is it possible to mix both Java and Scala and the application? Yep. So, uh, um, Scala is a language that was, that's been built from the ground up to be interoperable with, mm -hmm. with Java. So when you compile a Scala class, it produces a class file that looks just like a Java class in many ways. So Java code can just pull it. And similarly, when, Java, when Scala makes a method call, it looks just like uh, it's, it's calling the same sort of things that, um, that Java provides. So you can um, implement uh, Java interfaces with Scala, you can call methods, you can instantiate things. It's, it's not 100% interoperable, there, there are some rough edges. But for the most part, yeah, you can combine Java and Scala all over the place. Yep. The reverse, the reverse routing. Yes. So that's part of, of the framework. When um, that routes file, uh, Play actually compiles that to Scala code, and the Scala code will compile some Java, JavaScript code. And then that JavaScript code knows how to build those, those URLs. It knows the methods, so when you do an AJAX call, it'll use the right method from the routes call. Uh, and it knows the parameters it takes, it knows whether they're path parameters or query string parameters, and, and builds it all for you so that you don't need to worry about it. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, your framework is run in your own web server, or can you run any web server? Uh, Play Framework runs, um, is built on top of Netty, uh, so it, it has to, to run on top of Netty. Uh, so it can't, for example, run on top of a, a servlet API. A uh, servlet API doesn't actually provide what, what the framework needs, particularly with uh, asynchronous I.O. capabilities. Yep. So um, out of the box, there's relational database support. So anything that <coughs> provides a JDBC driver, uh, which is pretty much every relational database, can be used. Um, and like I said, it, it's interoperable with Java. So you've got the whole Java ecosystem of database support. So anything, really. Though when it comes to doing reactive and asynchronous I.O., there's, there's not a lot out there that, that does uh, in the way of asynchronous database drivers on the JVM. Yep. So one of the advantages of using something like Angular or Angular versus just jQuery on the client side. So I'm not the biggest front-end um, developer uh, when it comes to JavaScript framework. I, I haven't, I've looked briefly at Angular and I haven't looked at Ember. Uh, Knockout is the main thing that I've used, which I was using there. Uh, my understanding is that uh, Angular and Ember both give you much more of a framework, whereas Knockout just handles one thing, the, the binding, and then you use jQuery, for example, to do your request like I did there. Uh, I guess it depends. So uh, one of the nice things about using strap jQuery and, and then with something like Knockout is uh, you can substitute things in and out very easily, whereas if you're using a full framework, then that's going to be a lot more difficult to, to get to work with other, with other stuff that you might want to work, um, work with. That'll, I think though that'll get better with time as, as JavaScript frameworks matures. Is it fair to say that the uh, I think I think it's both. So one um, with the uh, with the client side support, play play is not um, play is not opinionated about what client side te technologies you use. So you, uh, we have um, I used a, a, a knockout JS template, then we also have Angular templates as well. So and and I've fed up a lot of people who are, who are writing play apps with Angular frontends. So um, uh, what, what Play does best is to give you the tools to, to support you in whatever you want to do there. So for example, with your JavaScript uh, modularization, with your JavaScript optimization, or in that case, I was doing coffee scripts and supporting that. Uh, that's, uh, that. That's where Play really helps you. And, and of course, the, the server side things, um, and the performance there, and the scalability. Yep. Um, it can. Uh, if you do things like start your own threads, if you do things like if you're using thread locals, can we, uh, there's lots of things that you can do that will prevent um, top code rewriting from, from collecting your past numbers. Uh, if you if you stay away from those things, generally it's fine. We only we only reload the application code, uh, so the libraries that you use, which are going to tend to do those things, they don't get reloaded. They stay there, and so if they do create a thread, which a lot of them do. It's fine. Um, yeah, it, it depends, but it depends on what you're doing. So do you have the usually enabled production server? Sorry. Um, is the no, 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 Compilation has never been, speed has never been as common as biggest strength. Um, we've, um, some changes have been made to the SVT incremental compiler uh, recently that, um, that, that allow it to, to um, 
not read part of the world. So you can't really play two one and two o. You add a method to a um, to a control and it reads part of the world, and that's slow. And a big project can take a minute, which is obviously not <laughs> the hot reloads that you want. Um, but no, the uh, we've made some types of made some uh, massive improvements there. Some of them will be available in Play 2 2 and some of them in the future SPT release. Um, and we've got that. So, yeah, for example, adding your route, only read piles, three files. Right. Um, I think we will do the rest of the questions, take it offline. Um, and I James, you're here until in Singapore? Um, here today. Here today, and then you're flying back. I'll fly back tomorrow. Right. Otherwise, I would have loved to invite you in the communities here. But nevertheless, a big thanks to James for coming up from Sydney. So while the next speaker gets uh, set up, uh, Josh, let me speak a